what it is to be a man in today's society. It's a big question that the backlash I often get from men is, oh, but if I'm just feeling my emotions, I'm going to be useless in the world. So what we're talking about here is shadow, anything that we've suppressed, deemed unacceptable. If you don't allow space for that tap to turn and, and release some of that energy, the egg starts to crack. Learning a new way of thinking and feeling and not trying to think your way through your emotions, but actually feel. That reminds me to walk straight into the very thing that scares me because it's there where I find my expansion. Welcome to the Authentic Man Podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness, and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking, and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, 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 welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers, as you know that. Right, I'm a men's dating relationship an intimacy coach and also do a lot of work with men around masculinity. And today's topic, when we really dive into many different things with, with Alexander from uh, Unmasked Man, but we really touch a lot upon about direction and purpose as well as leadership, like the different aspects and elements of leadership. How can we come into powerful leadership? What happens? Why do we abdicate leadership or avoid stepping into leadership? How does our father and our father wounds affect how we relate to leadership. You know, what's the essence of our emotions and how could we work for our emotions for creating more depth, more connection, as well as we talk some stuff about inner boy and our boy psychology and how we can come from boy psychology into man psychology. And yeah, it's, it's one of those episodes that really weaves across a lot of what we we touch on and talk about when it comes to men's work. We come to talk about men integrating the, the emotional work and also the relational work with other men, the acceptance that we seek and want as well. So I love this episode. It's such a beautifully flowing episode. I hardly I hardly looked at my list of questions. <laughs> but if you're um before you jump into the episode, if you're listening to this and you're looking for support, especially you know around the, the world of of relationship and and getting into relationship, maintaining healthy and happy relationship, as well as you know, working with emotions, that's really core to the work that I do. And if you're interested in that, just pop open, pop down to um, the show notes because I'm taking on one more client uh, in in March. And um, yeah, get in contact. We can have a chat about how I can help you. But without further ado, I'll let you get into the episode. So listeners are back for another episode and back for another wonderful man in the work. Because I think that when I, I, I laugh to myself because of the people that I know and the people that I interact in my day-to-day life, when I talk about men's work or, or being a man, it's very common, the conversations I have. And I know that these conversations aren't common, commonplace in the world. And I love to speak to different men that are working in different parts of men's work. You know, I focus a lot on uh, men's relationships, the relational end of, of work. And some men focus really on the mental health end of the work. And some men really focus on like the being part of a man, the, the different aspects and archetypes of man. So today I have with a, a wonderful man who I've been following for a long time. We've been, I feel like we've been watching each other from afar for many years um, <laughs> and not absolutely got to, to have a chat. I have the wonderful Alexander with me today. How are you doing? I'm good, David, and I'm really honoured to be here. It's a real honour. Mm, that's really beautiful. I've been observing you and uh, the unmasked man. You know, you've been you've been 
putting your workout through and seeing the retreats and seeing the men look so joyful and happy. It's just been like, you know, I love to see, it's beautiful to see live video, not necessarily live video, or video of men in retreats because I think you probably experienced this, that men, they see, they hear about retreat and they're a bit like, oh, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. Like, mm-hmm. that's going to be a bit weird and odd. And then seeing the video of it, it kind of just brings it to life. And even those things still seem a bit odd and strange. <laughs> they get a kind of felt sense of like, what could it be like for me to be there? Like, what, you know, I see these men, they're smiling, they're happy. Or even if they are you know, doing some doing some work that feels aggressive and angry, we can put ourselves in and go, God, do I feel like that would benefit? So I, I love watching the, the reels and the video. Thank you, brother. Yeah, the Unmasked Man has been a passion of mine that I've birthed into the world over the last six years now. Yeah, 2018 was when it began. And my my mission was to support men, but also to to get men's work out there for it to be seen. Uh, and so when you say mm. about the, re- the, the, the videos, the reels the, of, of the retreats, it's really important that, that men see this work, that there's places and spaces to go and delve into. Because otherwise, um, it, it lays in the shadows, and and we kind of perpetuate that that kind of that, that men can't come to spaces like this to to heal. A lot of men don't even know it exists. So it's been amazing. Yeah, the feedback's been incredible. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's like you're really at that cutting edge of this work. You know, one of my clients, he's a he's a prof, like an entertainer, performer, presenter, and he was saying to me the other day, he's like, you know, you realize you're like. Like we, it was like he said to me, he's like, you realise you're at this like cutting edge of this men's work thing in the UK because there's probably less than one percent of men have ever heard of it, mm-hmm. which means that there's like this ninety nine percent of men who are your, you know, your untapped market, mm-hmm. and it can feel sometimes like you know you 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 really men aren't always the easiest to market to. I my feeling is sometimes I don't know what your experience <laughs> of that is, <laughs> but um, it's incredible what this work can do for a man and his life yeah a hundred percent this this work changed my life david it i spent many years um spiritually finding myself but still bypassing a lot of my core human emotions a lot of the wounded inner boy that kind of boy psychology mentality and it really really caused a lot of pain in my system a lot of repeat suffering um and when I found this work, it gave me purpose. And a man, in my opinion, has to have a purpose. He has to have that mission, that goal to feel alive and connected to his dharma. Um, but also uh, the, the, he- the healing that came with it, actually accessing the deeper emotions, giving me things like accountability, um, confidence, direction, focus, balance, um integrating parts of myself that i'd either cut off denied or suppressed so yeah it's been life-changing and i always say whenever the guys come on the retreats men's work is not for christmas it is for life it's not like a one fixed pill that you take uh, and you do a retreat and that's it it's like usually the retreats for for the men that join us it's the it's the launch pad it's the it's the first step of you know a long long journey ahead and I need this work in my life. I need brothers in my life continuously supporting me, challenging me, helping me grow and expand in my journey of what it is to be a man. And I'm still trying to find that out. Mm-hmm. It's a big question that what it is to be a man. I think, I think, and this is my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Mm-hmm. Women have gone through this huge revolution over the last kind of 50 to 70 years where we have redefined what it means to be a woman. Or you could argue that being a woman has just expanded and continues to expand in many ways. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that men have had the same journey at all. What it means to be a man hasn't really shifted, in my opinion, mm-hmm. very much for the last you know, 50, 100 years. You could argue in many ways it feels like it might have shrunk a little bit in certain areas. Um, but I'd love, to hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, what it is to be a man in today's society. Um, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell someone that they should be this or they need to be that. I, I can only speak from my own journey and experience. Um, I want to be a man that shows up in the world with a loving heart that has strength and power 
to to move forward in direction and focus and can also be really soft and loving and tender uh, a man that knows where my sword is when i need it uh, and i'm not floundering looking for it when when, when i do it's it's like it, I, I suppose the samurai knows his strength but he doesn't need to 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 use it or prove it uh, not overcompensating like an inflated shadow and not abdicating at the same time, not trying to control and dictate power or dictate the feminine aspects of the, the, the feminine outside of himself or internally, loving those parts, giving them space to move, but also holding that kind of strong masculine pillar. It's a dance every second, every minute, every day, every hour. Yeah, it's, it's a journey, I think, into maturity, emotional maturity. Mm, mm. Now, hearing him you say there that that the dance of the masculine and feminine, not just outside of us, which is you know often in my world of of kind of relationships and relating, is the focus. But I hear you say that in a that in a dance, in an alchemy of of kind of integrating those two things is 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 kind of what I'm hearing you say. Mm-hmm. And but there's also this part that you probably have experienced and noticed. Is that as men we sometimes resist that inner feminine? You know, we have our own stories and wounds about that. Like, what's what's been your experience for yourself personally and, and the men that you've worked with? Yeah, I mean, Jung called it wedding the anima, uh, and this is the feminine part of ourself. Uh, a lot of work that we do is is based on on the Jungian psychology approach. Let's say, um, my own personal experience has been incredible because. I am a human being, just like a woman. I feel emotions, anger rises in me, sadness, grief, shame. I feel the whole spectrum, the the tapestry of the human emotions. And if I deny, suppress, or cut off these parts, I cause myself a lot of damage. Um, I, 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 you, you know, if I'm a man that doesn't allow my anger to be alchemized and expressed in a healthy way, I cut off my power. And the anger eventually turns around and attacks the host. Yeah. So it might leak outwardly onto all my relationships, but it will also attack me internally within my mind. So men's work has given me the landscape to face the difficult parts and emotions and allowing the feminine aspects of myself to surrender, to be seen in front of other men, to break down, to crumble, um, You know, on the back of our shirts, there's nothing stronger than a broken man that has rebuilt himself. It's like allowing that, that surrender to then come back with, with, with that strength and, and for the strength and the surrender to sit parallel to each other. Um, you're not less of a man for feeling your emotions. You can still be very strong, very powerful. In fact, when a man has found his anger, he has found his power. And, and that's really, really, really important. And a lot of men have not expressed emotions such as anger in a healthy way. And certainly grief, grief is one that, that you know, is not necessarily allowed in the society that we live in often. And it can turn into depression. It can turn into that impotent energy of, of deflation, of shame, of of the the black dog coming every door every day to our doorstep but if it's given a space to be seen and heard it's amazing how quickly that grief can start to shift into joy so so important those the feminine aspect of surrender and letting go yeah mm. Mm. and it's, it's interesting it's what you say there about you know feeling of emotions you know i've often been talking about this stuff for years and the, the backlash I often get from men is like, oh, but if I'm just feeling my emotions, I'm going to be useless in the world. I'm just going to be, you know, in like a puddle crying or like just so present to our emotions. I'm not going to um, be able to work or create or even be in relationship. Like, what do you say to, to that kind of that, um, a very extreme view of seeing it? Yeah. So um, actually I was on the phone to, uh, good friend of mine Mitch who is part of the Unmasked Man the other day and he says he's he's very much struggled with his emotions to express them uh coming back coming from a rugby background you know having to be strong um and he wouldn't mind me sharing this and he he said I see men like you Alexander and 
I see you come to the retreats and you're able to express and release so much in, in a short period. And then immediately you're back up like 15, 20 minutes later and you're, you're like this strong pillar. And it just reinforces to me that actually by going down deep into it, then we can come back even stronger. Uh, and so it's not about going into it and staying in it and wallowing in it forever and just becoming a victim of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not also about manning up and just walking over and denying your emotions. It, it's a very fine balance that I think the more you do it, the more you learn. You, you go, right, something's coming up here. I need it to be seen, witnessed, and expressed. Whether I do that through writing, dance, screaming in the car, screaming underwater, hitting a tree, going to the gym, working out, whatever it is that needs to come up, I give it space to be seen. But it doesn't, over, it doesn't overcome me. It doesn't, doesn't dominate everything that, that moves through me that I get stuck in it. Uh, and and I think that's that's where some of this kind of new age language of kind of getting lost in that lover energy for eternity um, can can damage the the vulnerability that is now starting to come in men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I. It's um, it's almost counterintuitive, isn't it? That like if I go deep into these feelings, these emotions, as you said, like you know, mentioned anger. You mentioned grief and there's like things like anguish and sadness. If we we go into them, it's almost like diving into a pool. We we are completely immersed in them and then we float back to the top and we can get out. Whereas um and you kind of touched on this before around depression, and I would love to hear your thoughts on what I'm about to say is like I, I experience for a lot of men is that they their avoidance of feeling the feeling of sadness and grief and so forth. The, the way they want to avoid it perpetuates the emotion, yes. the kind of, not the light end of emotion, but this like, it the the texture of this emotion in their life because they avoid really going into it and allowing it to be felt. Yeah. And so then that builds up over time and then it over consumes a man. Where if, mm-hmm. if you've got a tap and you, you're, you, you've got practices in your week, your, your day, where you can almost release some of this tension yeah some of this anger some of this grief ways that you can start to channel it and you bring feeling into your 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 weekly life then suddenly you're not over consumed that tank isn't full uh, and then when that tank's full you you either get consumed or you leak it everywhere yeah Hmm. so it's learning a new way of thinking and feeling and not trying to think your way through your emotions but actually feel your way through the body, the emotions that arise in you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love the analogy you use there about the the tap with the tank, because many of us are walking around with this tank. There's just a couple inches below like overflow of, you know, stress, Mm -hmm. worry and anxiety, um, whether that's about our lives, our work, our relationships. And we have no taps. We have no taps and we keep taking more from, maybe for our own life, but other people's lives. And mm-hmm. because we, we never really were taught to have a tap. We never, we never got a tap. No one gave us a tap at five years old and said, son, when you're feeling, when it starts to get too much, go in, go in, go upstairs, grab a pillow, scream the shit out into this pillow, or put yeah. some music on, dance and move, or um, go in the forest with an ax and chop some fucking wood for a few hours and let it go. <laughs> no one yep. gives us those taps, do we? We just become like right. full, stiff, uncomfortable irritable uh anger starts to leak out it just um they're like big vessels that just hold all this feeling and emotion while simultaneously wearing the mask of being the strong man of not showing any of it mm-hmm. yeah and it just causes so much suffering we, we you know young men initiate boys initiate boys the angers are then released out in the streets, in the bars, in the, you know, anger rises and then it's just felt. There's no understanding of emotional release, the benefits of it, bringing it into our, our daily, weekly um, schedule, as I said. Uh, and it causes so much pain uh, for, the, for the world. I actually think of it more like an egg than a tank because you've got this egg with like a tap coming out of it, right? And if you don't allow space for that tap, 
to to turn and, and release some of that energy the, the egg starts to crack and then the, then it's mm-hmm. leaking everywhere and, and you know or it could just get such pr- high pressure that it just explodes and you know i think we see this i certainly had it going through uh, uh my life having to hold it together having to be strong all the time um it's exhausting it's exhausting and actually like hand holding my holding my hand up and saying do you know what i'm not okay today that doesn't mean i'm weak that doesn't mean that i i can't be strong tomorrow but today i'm not okay yeah mm-hmm. and what do you see is the impact on men's lives when they are you know that egg that starts to crack starts to leak um well, it depends what their primary emotion that they've suppressed is, uh, in my opinion, but it, it impacts their direction. It impacts their concentration. It leaks onto their families, their friends, the relationships, the people they care about. Let's say if you take an emotion like anger, it starts to leak out in microaggressions, sarcasm, uh, resentfulness, bitterness, starts attacking the, the host, the individual as the inner critic or the judger. Um, sends a man more into his his mind because he can't be there in the feelings or you've got the opposite where maybe a man suppresses his anger so much because he tries to be a nice guy and then he he builds those he, he, over time he he, he he takes his resentment jar and puts his resentment coins in that in that resentment jar and it builds up and builds up and builds up and just like the egg one day that cracks and explodes and he becomes the very man that he didn't want to be in the first place so it can show up in many different ways, but it always has a knock-on effect and, and usually harms and hurts a lot of people, including himself, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. And I, I, was in a, I was running a workshop on the weekend and I, it was a mixed workshop, but we ran two circles, a men's circle and a women's circle, and allowed the women to listen in on the men's circle and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it was really interesting to hear, and I've heard this in, in the groups I've run before, is often as men, we suppress the part of us or particularly emotions that we saw in our fathers that we disliked the most. <laughs> yeah. So say there you talk about anger, for instance, there was a number of men there who talked about fathers who had like quite bad tempers and could be quite angry. And I resonated with myself. My dad, once he had a quiet temper, but he had a way of sometimes talking to you that made you feel so small and tiny. Mm-hmm. And I've seen this in the men I've worked with, I see it myself, is where what we then do, kind of describing what you said there, is like we then suppress that emotion and be like, I'm not, if I express that emotion in the world, that that be, say, anger, for instance, or um, domination, Mm -hmm. I'm a bad man and I'm going to be like my father. Mm -hmm. And then what I also see is we tack on like anger is even uh, frustration, dislike, a whole load of other emotions that are perfect, you know, all emotions are perfectly fine, but they, we tack on a whole load of other emotions and ways of expressing ourselves that we deem to be negative in some way. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes we bring in other aspects of our masculinity, like assertiveness and leadership, and we go, well, leadership is aggressive. Aggression leads to anger, so I can't ever be a leader. I can't ever be assertive. Mm-hmm. We suppress all those parts of us because we just don't want to be like our fathers. I wonder if this is, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and, how that's shown up in you know your life the life of your of the men that you work with as well mm-hmm. yeah so what we're talking about here is shadow right anything that we've suppressed deemed unacceptable by ourselves or, or by others yeah society has has shamed it perhaps we've we've internally shamed it and the, there's there's a lot of gold in the shadow <clears throat> and when i when i say gold i mean good goodness yeah so Marianne Williamson says our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, it's that we're powerful beyond imagination. It's our light that scares us. And I, I would say that is, is true. Men come to the retreats and they're absolutely terrified to shine. And especially in England, right? You, you put your head mm-hmm. above the parapet and often people, you know, cut it off. They, you, can get, you can get to a certain level, but you get any higher, boy, and we're coming for you. It's that kind of energy, right? So it's, it's scary yeah. to be singing in the world and to, to rise up. And... Of course, in order to be powerful, you need to watch the parts of you that become a tyrant, that can control and dominate others. And you also have to watch the part of you that wants to abdicate and give your power away. And if you can walk this very difficult but beautiful tightrope 
of being a leader. And for me, being a leader is is burning a light so bright that your tribe and community can follow you, but then you can also fall back and allow someone else to step forward and you kind of almost like a loving father witness the beauty of what you've you've kind of created or inspired someone to then follow in your footsteps. So it's not about once once you've reached that point of leadership, it's not about gripping to it of control and power. It's actually about enabling and inspiring other men, young men, let's say, coming through, older men as well, to then find that sovereign energy in themselves. Um, so if you deny the parts that uh, you know are powerful within you, then you deny the world your greatness. Uh, and all because you're terrified of becoming your father. What a terrible shame. Yeah. I, I had this wound. My, my father was, uh, he's, he can be quite a tyrant. And uh, my whole leadership journey with my mentor, I've been terrified to become a tyrant. And, and <laughs> so much so that I would abdicate regularly. And my mentor has, you know, encouraged me over and over again that actually you, what you think might end up being tyrannical is actually just you s- stepping in the middle as a powerful leader. So don't hide that and don't be scared of that. And, and, and this is what I'd say is that there, there, is, a, there is also a fragrance of, of beauty in, in, in both, both the shadows or all of the shadows as well. The, the tyrant, for instance. Let's say if suddenly you need to act very quickly and you need to direct a, a lot of people very, very quickly because there's an emergency. You need that. It's not tyrannical energy, but you need that kind of strict discipline focus to organize the ship to respond to that emergency and and one could argue that's got you know some of the shadow characteristics of 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 strong leadership suddenly in there so you know it's there's there's beauty in all parts and it's integrating those parts and welcoming them that a man in my opinion can rise up into his his fullness mm-hmm. as you were saying that last piece there about how sometimes are those those shadow parts of us, even the ty- the tyrant in us, has a purpose, has a use, can come online to serve yeah. the world. I'm thinking of someone like Winston Churchill, you know, who we all know that he was a, an amazing leader during war times, and he was a terrible leader during peace. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he was a yeah. terrible leader during peace, but during war, under the very similar circumstances you mentioned, they're like the need to galvanize and move and mobilize people in a particular direction under a particular cause, mm-hmm. even when there's without too much um, conjecture and conversation, he was a wonderful, a wonderful leader. You know, he was mm-hmm. able to bring his some of his, uh, shall we say, traits and parts of his armory and make really good use of it in the world to serve the world or serve our nation, serve Europe to be a better place. But yet, mm-hmm. under different circumstances, those those tools in his toolbox were harmful to people, were harmful to himself, and actually didn't help him in his um, in his leadership and in, in his service to people. And, you know, when I say all that, it's like, oh, yeah, there's these traits about us, like, you know, fierceness or ruthlessness or even the niceness, you know, the other end. They have their their use, but it's really learning to have the dexterity and art of when to bring them to the world, to, to, to know when it is necessary in the moment to serve. 100%, 100%. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and that is the tightrope of walking uh, a path as a leader and, and stepping up into your sovereignty, and uh, not getting stuck there, not getting stuck in that tyrannical place and becoming a narcissistic, controlling, you know, muppet, <laughs> and, and also not not abdicating and spending your whole life. You know, one of my favorite qu- quotes. Um, in the world, and I, I, I share it at the retreats often, is Les Brown when he talks about, um, imagine if you will, you're lying on your deathbed many years from now, and all around you are your hopes and dreams that came to you, all the ideas, the inspirations that came to you for you to give them life, and now they must die with you. And it's like, pfft, whoa, for an abdicated king, looking up at these dreams and ideas you never wrote that book you know 
you never gave that TED talk, whatever it was. It's like, wow, that is potent. And that reminds me every day to walk into fear. That reminds me to walk straight into the very thing that scares me because it's there where I find my expansion. Yeah. And, and, and power can scare people on the other hand with the tyrant energy, right? So it's like, how can I navigate this? And, and the, in my opinion, the only way you can navigate it is with a good, solid uh, connection of, of brothers around you that will challenge you. Not just, not just men, actually. I've learned so much from, from my partner. You know, she has challenged me regularly. Why are you hiding? Or you're being a bit of an idiot, Alex, you know? <laughs> so. Mm. It's, it's it's potent that quote yeah mm, mm. yeah god as you were saying it i was like imagining <laughs> that you know how many men go to their deathbed how many men go to their deathbed and look around and go fuck there were all these things i wanted to do with my life and i didn't because i was afraid of taking action or i was afraid of the rejection i was afraid of failing or mm. I didn't think I was good enough. Like all these stories that we tell ourselves why mm-hmm. we can't mm-hmm. and they, we, we lay ourselves to, to rest with disappointment, actually mm. all this disappointment, all the relationships we never had, you know, or the children we never deeply connected with because mm-hmm. of some way we didn't believe that we were allowed or that we had the capacity to, to, to make those things happen. Yeah. Yeah. And this is in the archetypal format that we use. This is the the shadow magician, right? This is in fear of making a decision. He makes none. He becomes the hair splitter. He sits on the rock and there's no action. There's lots of ideas. There's lots of thoughts. You know, he may, maybe may have fought, you know, he, he loves his children and he, he thought about his children in his head, but did he ever action and, and reach out to his children? Or did he ever create that that novel that he wanted to write or journey to that country that he wanted to go to? Or did it live all up in the head, yeah, as mm. ideas that will die with him? The overthinker. Mm. Mm, the procrastinator as well, yeah, yeah. And I've been guilty. Yeah, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. I'm not this man. I have very much sat on that rock at times. But then I've realized, oh, I'm ruminating again. I need to move. And that's when it when I call for my warrior via my king. My, my, that's that's the part of me that creates the action. Mm-hmm. And you've touched on the the four archetypes a little bit. And for those listeners who are not so um, au fait with them, I'd love you to give us a brief overview of you know the warrior, the lover, the king, and, and the magician. Yeah, gladly. Um, so these kind of came to popularity in the the 1990s uh, in the mythopoetic men's movement and a famous book written by Robert Moore and Douglas Shiele, which is King, Warrior, Lover, Magician. Um, And each archetype represents a different uh, point on the compass. So if we were to start with East, uh, three o'clock, the the lover is the part of us that is creative, beautiful, connected to his sexuality, sees color in the life, is able to play, be joyous, have the fun of the inner boy, laugh and dance and 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 just overwhelming sense of 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 beauty with the world. And when he's not in that, he can become an addict and and kind of trying to fulfill that eternal orgasm. Um, or trying to live at that eternal orgasm, should I say, um, filling the hole inside of himself with porn, sex, drugs, alcohol, um, or he can become impotent, which is the deflated shadow, and that's that's a man that's lost, cut off, disconnected, and sees very much grey in life. And so we're trying to work, we're trying to find the healthy qualities of each archetype, and then you move to the south, which is the warrior. Uh, This is the man that's disciplined, focused, connected to himself and uh, alive with the present moment. Um, When he is not in this, he can then suddenly become the inflated. This is the part that is is deeply, deeply despises anything weak inside himself or outside world. Um, It's always running over his emotions. Or the opposite to that is the nice guy, this masochist who becomes the doormat and uh you know you say jump i say how high and uh i almost don't exist right and i've definitely been all of these shadows and some of the good qualities that i've already spoke of and then round to uh nine o'clock on the compass 
uh, we've got the magician and the magician is the part of ourselves that is deeply connected to something greater than this three-dimensional form it's the part that sees the the tip of the iceberg and understands the whole subterranean level below there's more to this existence right there's a calling it's the inventor the shaman the doctor the guru the wise man the sage and the inflated shadow is the, the the overthinker or the detached manipulator, the con man, the charlatan, the lawyer that that doesn't really care about his clients. Let's say, um, and he can do incredible damage with this power, such as the politician that that causes a lot of pain in the world um, through his own goals. And then the deflated is is the dummy. Uh, this is the the man that. Um, is very slippery, very elusive, wants all the power of the magician, but doesn't want to put the hard work in maybe, um, and can become very bitter or play, play the dummy, you know, uh, wants to learn the guitar, but never wants to put the effort in. I've been, I've been that man. Um, <laughs> and then we move around to the King, which is the final, you know, journey of, of really encompassing and welcoming all the emotions around the table, uh, and, and integrating the younger parts of himself and, um, you know, he leaves a legacy. He's, he's got a mission. He's got a purpose. Um, he, he, he doesn't cut off, deny or suppress parts of himself. Um, and he lives in his heart. And when we're not in those healthy qualities, I've already touched upon them, we can become a tyrant with control, power, narcissism, or we can abdicate where we give away our power to the very thing we just described, a tyrant. And we, we say, no, 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 this power is way too much. I can't handle it. So what this compass gives us is a navigation tool to explore the shadow, which, you know, when you're trying to see in the dark without a light, it's very difficult. Uh, the parts of us that are very hidden in our subconsciousness, then then suddenly we're able to see it using this, this masculine framework. And it's been life-changing for me. You know, I really... I live it every single day and I teach it yeah pretty much every single day as well so it's it's been it's been a blessing yeah how did this this compass help you with finding direction and, and, and purpose and how has it helped help the men that you've worked with find direction and purpose for me it was noticing my most obvious shadows first so like and and accepting them yeah so noticing the addict in me, noticing the part that drives over my emotions. So giving space for, to, to allow my emotions to be processed. Noticing, oh, the addict's back again. What's he running away from? Oh, this sense of, of always trying to grasp at something. So get, getting addiction under control, getting um, this, this hard talking voice in my head under control, getting the inner critic under control. Yeah. And when I say control, not like trying to grasp him, but actually like listen to him and bring him back home. And then mm. noticing the part of myself, as I talked about previously, that abdicates or, or is terrified of becoming my father. Yeah. So it, it, by highlighting the shadows, I was able to accept them. By accepting them, I was able to draw the good qualities out of them and then move more into the healthy, uh, balanced, masculine middle of each one. Uh, and so if I've got a pendulum that swings wildly and bipolars from one to the other, the more knowledge I know about them, I move towards the top of that pendulum. And so instead of it being like a, a full swing left or right, now I'm just kind of moving a little bit and my, my barriers are getting a lot narrower so I can live a life more focused in, in the center of the healthy qualities of those archetypes and be the man that I suppose I want to be. In the world not actually not supposed the man that i do want to be in the world yeah yeah got it and I, the question that kind of came to me <laughs> as you finished there was like what was the hardest of the four for you to kind of um integrate or come into balance with the magician yeah the, ma the magician is the <clears throat> when i'm at the retreats and we've got someone very much in their head, their mind. They live through the stories and the programs of their mind, um, just as I can and have as well. It's very hard to unravel them. Um, and so when accepting the parts of my own 
internal magician archetype, this part of me that lives in my mind, is attached to my stories, is attached to my programs, is attached to my victimhood, um, realizing, shit, I can manipulate. Wow, I can control. Wow, I can lie. Oh, shit. I don't want to be that man. So being really honest with myself and, and also and I, what comes with great knowledge is judgment then as well. <laughs> you start to judge everyone and everything and so i'm kind of doing a lot of unlearning now of 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 actually notes trying to spot myself why, why am i judging why am i comparing this part that always wants to judge and and try and work out you know where do i sit in the room of society right now um and just like allow all that story to fall away and, and then drop more into the present moment and see people for who they are in front of me, not for the way that this kind of part of my story is judging them based on maybe an overlaying projection from, from someone I'd met previously. So it's like that is really hard to spot um, because I'd argue that the part of you that helps you spot that is the good qualities of that archetype. So it's, it's like a, yeah, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> But it's been, been, been a blessing in the process as well. Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it's quite a, um, I think, quite a rampant part of us in society now with the advent of technology. It's like everyone has a judgment about everything and we can be very quick to jump to opinions and assumptions about a person. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for my work in relationship is really eye-opening to see see that you know that part of the magician that is like judging and having opinions very rapidly about other people we aren't as willing well i can't talk about the past we're not so willing to like kind of take two steps back and and observe and be like oh what is the case here like why would someone be acting like this why would they be feeling like this instead of the the kind of very quick judgment the very quick assumptions the, the the finger point which i think is a very easy place for us to 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 go to as a society in general and i think maybe i observe this in men quite a lot is this kind of black and white thinking of like mm-hmm. that's right that's wrong and i don't need to i don't want to hear any other opinions or thoughts about that i've decided i'm going to conserve any energy about thinking about that because this is just how it is mm-hmm. yeah i think there's a danger when we just react and we don't respond. Mm. And and so this is, you know, in the work that we do, this is boy psychology to man psychology. So the boy becomes very reactive, yeah, sees something, boom, instantly wants to, you know, get on the keyboard and type. Um, <laughs> the responding aspect creates space. So I've 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 actually heard what you're saying. Yeah. I've not I've not just thought about what I'm going to tell you next. And in that space, I can try to understand the individual. So when I've received like a, a hate mail or, or someone being aggressive to me or, or, or whatever it is, you know, trolling, I've, I've been trolled on, on, um, on social media, um, I could react or I could actually sit back and, and, and go, I wonder what might be going on for that individual you know, to write that. I don't take it so personally. Um, or if I'm with my lover and she says something that might take me into a place where I feel my like, wounded inner child, instead of like reacting from that place, it's like I take the pause and I, I, I hold that part of myself for a moment and I really hear what she has to say. And then I respond. And I, I think when we can live in a world like that and emotional maturity is a lot higher and we, we're doing that work continuously, it's very powerful. When we just live in this world, and I think certainly it's escalated with social media and the ability to just get hold of anyone at any point because of our mobile phones, and we can make judgments up very quickly from seeing a 10-second reel on you know, socials, we don't know the man, we don't know the woman, we don't know their story, we don't know what's going on for them right now, the troubles that they've faced, the traumas that they've faced. And 
It's one thing that we get the men to do at the retreats is look into another man's eyes and say, this man has suffered huge trauma probably in his life, just like you. This man's probably been lied to, manipulated. He might have faced loss, abuse, grief, you know, so much. And so we try and meet there rather than meet like what we look like, what our jobs are, you know, what our age is. Let's try and meet in the space of curiosity. And I love that, being curious. It, it connects people. It's important. Mm. Mm. Mm, yeah. I'm hearing you say there, it's like, yeah, we've got social media. And I, I often describe it as <clears throat> we're like avatars in the world. You know, we're on our online avatar. And through that avatar, we're into the world and we're talking to other people's avatars. But because we're kind of a few degrees removed because we're not in front of each other, you know, you've got your phone and it's almost quite, we feel quite bold or some people feel quite bold, you know, to say things that they would never dare say to someone, you know, in, <laughs> to their face because they can say it in this very anonymous way. Like I can just throw out my, my opinions and thoughts on your 10 seconds or seeing you for two minutes somewhere. I can make my, all my judgments can come to the fore and be projected straight onto you. Yeah. Um, and then you receive them and it, it's, you know, it can be hard when people do that about things that, you know, you know, for your work, when you're really deeply passionate about, they've mis misinterpreted your intentions or your actions very deeply. Mm -hmm. And we, it's rife because it's easy, you know, people are protected to never, never say anything um, in person. And how do you see this boy psychology? You know, you mentioned it. I'd love to explain maybe a bit more about the boy psychology, that, mm -hmm. and also like how that, is negatively impacting men's lives. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah. So as I said, bo boy psychology is is very much coming from from that wounded place of reaction, of emotional immaturity. Um, there's no space there. There's just there's just literally like whatever comes up from our amygdala, this emotional response center, it's like, boom, you're going to get it, right? I'm angry, boom, I want this, boom, I need to control this, boom. Uh, and when we go on the journey of understanding our own emotional maturity as a man, we can start to move to the, the more um, man psychology approach, which is the response, the time, the neocortex of the brain is much more online and like, okay, right, this rational thinking part, I can see why there might be judgment here. I can see why there might be anger here. I can understand and be curious, as I said before, the, the whole landscape and what's coming at me and I can choose given time to respond in, in the most sovereign way that I want. Um, and the question was, how did it impact men's lives? Is that, was that the question? Mm. Yeah. Um, so I know I'm going to just, again, talk from my own perspective. Um, I can speak for the clients that I work with as well, though. I can see it change their relationships how they show up for their partner. Um, certainly men come with a very masculine approach of like, I'm going to fix everything. <laughs> and so what it changes is, is to be curious and to hear. So to hear their partner, to, 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 to really listen to what people are saying to them so they can actually go and review some of the feedback because there might be some gold in that feedback or maybe I do interrupt people or maybe I, I do jump to solutions too quickly what if I gave some space to just listen to give feedback to say I really hear that you're feeling sad today what do you need in that you know starting to bring in a level of communication which is really inquisitive and supportive because often, a lot of the time, we just need to be seen and heard, yeah? And it's in the not being seen and heard that the, the younger part comes out, and then that causes the conflict. So if, if what I see for men, my clients, for myself, is that I have better, deeper connections and relationships, and I'm more honest with myself as well, because that part can also play havoc in the nice guy. Because when I'm reacting and just going, yeah, that's fine. I'm totally fine. Yeah, no, just take the shirt off my back, take my trainers and my trousers. That's absolutely fine. Go and take them. I'm fine. And then you give them a big smile. It's like, no, actually, I'm taking a moment to go, no, you can't have those things. 
yeah, this is my boundaries. Um, <laughs> and I don't really need to explain myself. This is just a solid no from me. So you really start to connect to your truest essence. And I, I, know, I meet a number of men that say, say to me they feel like a chameleon, that they, they just literally don't know who they are and they just respond to whatever needs to be responded to. This nice guy energy of, of you know, if I make everyone's happy and, 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 and do work getting everyone else's needs met i'll be happy and it's like no it doesn't play out like this can i own my own needs can i own my own sovereignty and can i speak my truth so it has many many benefits yeah mm, mm. and it's really you know what i heard you say there it's like it has profound coming out of this boy psychology of react reactivity and kind of what i was hearing there is was like a self-centeredness as well mm -hmm. it allows us to start to take responsibility instead of that I can do everything, which is kind of an arrogance into a self responsibility of like, I'm going to take this, I'm responsible for myself and how the world, I impact the world. And that actually brings men into their power and alongside with the kind of, I'm going to respond to what's happened. I'm going to take a little moment of space. I'm going to hear, I'm going to hear my partner's criticism. I'm going to notice in my own body the desire to shout back, to react back, to say something mean passive aggressive outright aggressive defensive and i'm going to allow that emotion to subside or just be with it and allow what's in the space in between to then speak my kind of truest words in that moment you know mm -hmm. you know as an example of instead of if your partner I love to always use examples of household chores. When you live with a partner, you realize it. it's always such a great I, example. You know, why have you not done the washing up? <laughs> <laughs> why have you not done the washing up? You never do the washing up. It's very easy for our boy, our inner boy, our inner child to be like, I did it last week. What do you mean? I did it earlier. Instead of being, of stopping them and hearing that, being like, ah, oh, yeah, I didn't do the washing up. I just mm -hmm. left it. And, mm -hmm. and in that space might be to say, Hey, you're right. Yeah, I didn't do it. I'm really sorry, actually. And I'll, I've got some stuff on right now, but I'll do that later. You don't, you don't worry about that. I will take care of it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that difference from being, and I kind of take this into a relational sense. It's like a difference between being like, I'm always defending myself and I'm trying to be right mm -hmm. versus I'm trying to collaborate and work as a team. Mm hmm. Yeah, because to be right all the time is a very lonely place and it creates a lot of separation and you just nailed it, right? It's not about being a team. And and the way we maneuver those small fires is actually how will then, you know, how will our life look with those when those larger fires come along? And so something as simple as the dishes may seem trivial, but actually if you're having a lot of those kind of discussions each week and the language being used is you never, you always, it's like, okay, the, the, the boy psychology is taking a hold of us in, in that place. And again, instead of being curious and, and asking for what you need, maybe it's like, I've got a lot of work on right now. I just need to, to, to wash these dishes up later. Um, but acknowledging, yeah, acknowledging the other person and being seen, heard and expressing your needs, knowing that those needs might not get met as well. That's that's important one to to understand. Mm. Mm. And as he, as he there touched on needs, it kind of springs to mind is that, you know, a lot of men, they, they're very self-sufficient. You know, we can be highly independent men. You know, we've been taught that we should never lean on anybody. Maybe we came from households where our mothers were reliant on somebody and they let them down. Or maybe, you know, use my own example, actually, my mother was got married when I was eight years old to another man and he really just took advantage of her. And we learned the story of like, I need to be an independent man and do it all myself. That's the only way I can stay safe. And you talk about needs there and it's like, how do we, as men, because we're so used to fulfilling all our own needs and wants, how do we, as men, kind of mature out of that independence into what I see as something much higher, which is that interdependence that I can rely on Alexander because he's here and he's an outstanding man. I can trust him. I can trust that mm. he can be there for me and I can be there for him as, as well. And I imagine this is something you see with a lot of men, they come very independent and they shift into this independent. How do we start to do the work to create that trust for ourselves, I think, with other people 
but also the, the the growth that we allow other people to start to meet our needs and our wants in our lives. Yeah, so I think there's many ways that this question could be answered. So a lot of men that come to me actually don't know how to express their needs, first of all. So, so for those men, it's about finding them. But for those men that know their needs but doesn't don't trust, then something like the retreats that we offer, group work is so powerful for that. Because one-on-one work is is great, but actually for, to get that man to trust a room, you, you, you can't do in, in that space. You have limited tools in, in that space f- fully. And the power of group work is that when one man steps forward, he does the healing for the whole room. So we get to reinforce these new ways and challenge these old beliefs that no longer serve us. So, you know, I had a great example late last year um man we're in a, we're circling up and um man just darted out the room and um one man went and got him i asked the team member to come go and get him he brought him back in and i said what's going on and he said i don't trust men i don't trust any of you and i asked him you know what has that cost you in your life he's like to live a life of being alone to live a life where I'm constantly in fear of other men. And I said to him, well, what what about today if we took a risk? We took a risk and I invited you to step into the circle and 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 to to see if if we can create some of that trust. And we led a, a process where he was allowed to be really vulnerable and surrender and to be held and it just transformed him. And and you know, what he deeply feared which was to trust men, he also deeply wanted. Yeah. So he had this push pull. I'm going to push everyone away because if I actually get what I want, that's terrifying. Yeah. What if they do actually, like, what if they are trustworthy? Then I've got to break this old paradigm, right? So you saw the breaking of the man, but then you saw the, the rebuilding. And and that that part where we move from the old stories, and this kind of goes back into what we talked about earlier, that part where we also leave boy psychology of victimhood, it can be um, terrifying, but it can also be incredibly liberating. Uh, and that is the first step of a thousand step journey. And, and he took that step and I've watched that man grow ever since last October into trusting men more, showing up more and and changing the old belief because you know his story was that i'm going to get beaten up you know that's that's how he'd received men as a childhood Mm. from an abusive father from brothers beating him you know i can't trust men so we're we're giving the the inner child of that man a new story and actually there's incredible men out there that i trust daily you know that i've created a network of men that support me and i support them and they support each other and and this is why community is so so powerful um to to challenge these old beliefs and no longer being this kind of lone wolf it doesn't serve a man he's deeply sad in that place Mm. yeah the the lone um the lone wolf doesn't it just the lone wolf isn't real and it doesn't work you know like it doesn't it doesn't work at all and even in in the the animal kingdom it's not actually a thing you know the wolves travel in packs they look after each other they have they look after their weak they look after their old the alpha wolf isn't necessarily aggressive to all the others he's actually you know one of the ones who is really looking after and tending to and leading the 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 group and it's amazing to hear you describe that there that practice and process because he it wasn't just he had to think he didn't just think his way out of his story you know he had the story he expressed it you gave him an opportunity to to challenge that to take a risk to have a different experience and he stepped forward to have a different embodied experience and that embodied experience can shift you know a lifetime of of story a lifetime of what he'd been thinking Mm -hmm. because he got a new imprint that's more present that's more recent that's more vivid of a very different outcome to what he'd been experiencing when he was a young man, young boy. Yeah, hundred percent. And this is why, for me, and I'm not just keep trying to plug the retreats, but this, 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 the possibility of doing group work is so transformational because there's so much that can be done 
when you just sat one on one in a room talking about your emotions, but when you're actually somatically embodying this new way of what it feels like to be angry, to be powerful, to trust, to let go, to surrender, to embody your grief and be celebrated in that all the way through, to be held in that all the way through, to be non-shamed. There's no guilt there. There's no judgment there. Wow. It's like giving birth to that, that inner child all over again and going, this can be a different way that you live your life. And it's, it's beautiful to watch. It's my favorite thing in the world. It's my passion. And I think, you know, it's where I come alive. I, I love supporting men in these deep processes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just, it's, I think we, we have, I've had a, a, a weekend, well, not weekend, a one day workshop, a uh, mixed one on the week, week, on the weekend. I get my words out eventually. And <clears throat> I spent most of the last few years doing everything online, like, you know, a lot of people. And in this group, there were six men, six women, and we went through, you know, an array of relational practices between the men and women. And it was amazing to see how at the beginning of the day, they were very like nervous and closed off to each other, sitting alone in the corner. And we took them through some very simple practices that allowed them to observe their story, their assumptions, their fears in a space that where they felt safe. They knew that it was held. They knew that it was warm. They knew that no one else was going to enter that space other than the people that were in there. There was going to be no shame. There's going to be no judgment because they had, and they had clear boundaries and so forth. And it's, as you said, it's remarkable what can occur for someone when they start to feel the experience that they're having. And also, like you said, witness other people having their experience and being able to learn from seeing others as well. Not just, and it's not a reading, it's not a, it's not just listening to some stuff. It's like, I've listened, I've heard, I've understood, and now I'm in it. Now I'm feeling it. Now I'm experiencing this new experience and this way of being that I didn't think was safe or I didn't think was possible and I'm here and it's not just safe and possible is beneficial to me and a service to the people around me. Yeah. And this is why what I think makes the unmasked man really special is that it comes from the leaders as well. So it's, it's not like a pyramid. It's a circle of, of Kings together. I regularly break down and cry. I regularly share my deepest, darkest. I, I, step forward to demo exercises in anger release or you know any time that a teacher is kind of putting him putting himself above anyone that joins right there's there's you're not empowering anyone anymore you're you're, you're just you, you, you it's the shadow magician suppressing people down there's 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 a there's a transference there energetically that is not supporting that man's growth where you can you can be equals but then also step into that leadership and then step back into equality. That's very, very special. And I think that's what we get down to a T really, really, you know, beautifully well at the Unmasked Man is because we have a team facilitators of five men. It's like if one of them's, you know, really feeling something, then he steps forward, expresses it. The four other men can hold. Yeah. So it's, it's not like the, the ship's losing. It's it, the, the man steering. It, it just, it gives permission for these men that have turned up that don't know us from from anyone and then they can they can see us go to this rawness straight away wow you've just given me permission rather than me just standing there going going go on then be vulnerable but i'm not going to like i would never do that i'd always lead from the front and i think that's what makes it very very special um and very very deeper in the transformational process that we can access because it because of that it it makes it so safe Mm. and it's also bring up this this thing that we lack so much i think as men in the world is like leadership um role models role models that we can see and be like oh this is how we this is what's possible for me this is how i can be this is how i can be a better man because we're shown um all the time the ways in which as men we shouldn't be you know um which you know we have the andrew takes who are all over the internet and all over the newspapers but what's not happening and is that we're not we're not shown the men that we can look at and go, oh, that is a good man. Who all those qualities in that man are qualities that I can um, not so much mimic, mim- mimic, but like I can start to embody in myself. We we have this habit in society of like we give a lot of energy into the things that we shouldn't be. And in the case of men, I think we've put a lot of energy in saying like what t- toxic masculinity is and how it looks. And men don't do that, but we've left a huge void 
around、mm. how we want men to be, how we want men to show up in the world.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. We're we're focusing on on the negatives. This elder knowledge, I call it, has got lost. Yeah, so the the sovereign energy, the mature masculine, the beautiful elements of the masculine energy that's held by the elders, passed down from generation to generation. That the elder lineage has been cut. Yeah, and and as I go back to earlier, boys then initiate boys. So we're celebrating boy energy over and over again. We're celebrating immaturity over and over again, and then masculinity is, as a whole, getting slandered for that because we have this pretty much running the masculine arena. And actually, like you said earlier, it's small, but it's beginning. the The men's movement, certainly in this country, is growing. It, there's men like yourself, men like us. It, you know, I've got so many. Powerful men I know in doing this work、uh, that are sharing their gifts, sharing their retreats, sharing their men's circles, supporting men one to one coaching, and it's like we're all starting to wake up. And then they're building their communities, and then connecting them with other communities. And, and the more that we can move into the sharing mentality of resources and 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 sharing, we will thrive rather than like holding on tight that kind of controlling energy, and and actually、we'll, we we will we will suffer. As a consequence, yeah. So,、um, the more that we can celebrate this, the more that we can again that positive reinforcement. If if a man is going to do the work, he's not perfect. He's human. He's fallible. But when he gets home, let's celebrate him for that. Yeah, let's support、mm-hmm. him in that rather than pull him up for more of his flaws that he that he has yet to look at.、Um, you know, give the man a chance to grow. Otherwise, what's the point? You know. Yeah, yeah, we love to.、Um, we love to tear people down. We love to build them up so we can tear them down.、Mm-hmm. I watched、um, the, the, the David、uh, the Beckham's documentary, and、yes. I, I, I found I found a couple of things really interesting in there. <laughs> One of the things I found, and I, I'll touch on this in a bit. One of them was the narrative of his his whole life of him always being the underdog and having to fight. That was an interesting narrative that they carried through the the whole the whole piece. Mm-hmm. But it was very interesting to, to observe the way in which he was kind of built up to be this golden boy, this golden boy, this golden boy, this golden boy, and golden boy. And then he made one mistake, you know,、mm-hmm. he got sent off, and the the wolves and the vultures went at him. The the media, his own manager, and it was really interesting to observe. It's like, wow, this is what we do, you know. Someone makes a singular mistake, we hold them to this level of perfection, which they, you know, they they never. Uh, requested or they never put out themselves, and then we attack and we attack and we attack, and we wonder why no one wants to stand up and be a role model. No one wants to put their head above the parapet because we have this habit of of just looking for the chink in the armor and putting a crowbar and a and a jackhammer in between it and going for them. Yeah, and we have to own our own judgment and projection of perfectionism that we're looking for in that transference. We're looking for this al- almighty savior and leader in someone else, and then when they don't become that, we shoot them down and we 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 criticize them. Where、well, what if we we instead of looking it for it outside of ourselves? Great, it, it, it's amazing to have role models, but also be the change in the world. And, mm. and and step forward, and I do get it. Trust me, the amount of times I've wanted to, like, give up, <laughs> abdicate. This is too hard. As the unmasked man's got more aware, more popular, and 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 more、um, more widespread. You know, my mentor said to me, as as you as you grow in success, the people that think you're a dick will also grow. You know,、mm. <laughs> it's just going to go hand in hand. And when I got my head around that, it, I kind of slept better at night because, yeah, there was a time where I, I was getting quite a a lot of a lot of trolling and like just for just for shining, yeah,、mm. just, literally just for shining and just wanting to express my gift to the world. And、um, I wasn't doing it, in my opinion, in a patronizing way. It was just coming through with a sincere, loving way. But some people don't like that. They don't want that. Um, and they're not ready for that, and that's whatever's going on for them is going on for them. I'm not trying to change them. I'm not. I don't want them to change.、Um, but it is it is hard to step forward because you know everyone's got a past.、Um, 
it it can get pulled apart. You see that in with celebrities. Um, but I, it's made me realize even more, have a deeper connection with myself and go, do you know what? The people that really know me, they know me and I know myself and that they're, they're, they're like my world that I'm going to concentrate on and, and actually everything else out of my control. I can't, I can't, I can't control it. I can't control what someone thinks of me. You know, one person might think I'm great. Another person might think I'm an idiot. And the more I surrender into that, but don't move away from my authentic self, then that's incredibly empowering. And and that's the the space that I try to encourage men to get to, Um, you know, what we can't control, let's let go of. It's not easy. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, it's not easy. The world is um, full of those of very strong opinions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially like we said on on the social media. I'm sure you've experienced it with with um, you know, having a podcast, putting yourself out. I see your work, it's amazing. You you're shining every day, but that's not always that's not always loved, you know? So yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it's something that that causes I think we've touched on this. It's like it causes men to shrink. It's like, "Oh, I don't want to put my gifts out into the world." And I imagine there's a lot of amazing creators, minds, um, intellectuals, um, coaches in the world who never put themselves out into the world because they're worried about the possibility of someone disagreeing with them or someone pointing some sort of hate or dislike or critique towards them. And mm-hmm. I see that as a real shame, actually. And you know, I've worked with a few kind of coaches and creators and it's like, ah, oh, we bring in that resilience that you talk about, like the acceptance and the um the surrender as well of like, okay, there's going to be people that don't agree with my message and that's okay. And I don't have to fight with them. I can just let them be. And if I choose, we're lucky in this world now in that really we always have the choice. We can always just not talk to somebody. We can also always not interact with somebody and allow them to move upon their path and allow ourselves to to move in that direction as well. Yeah, I like to compare it to because a couple of men um, we're running the facilitator training at the moment, and a couple of men like in fear of making a decision, they make none, and that they're, they're they're worried to put their ideas and inspirations out there into the world. And I, I say, imagine painting a painting, and you're then next to you, you've got like a hundred other people painting their painting, wow. and you're so focused on what other people are painting that you forget what you're painting. Yeah. And actually, if you just like block them out and focus truly on your mission, your dharma, your legacy, what you want to create, I don't mean be narcissistic in that that sense, but just really channel, what is this serving me? Is this content serving me? Does this help that I'm always looking at that or that or comparing and judging and analyzing? What if I just put all of that energy into my mission? Wow. Then look how quickly you could you know, create or get to where you want to get to. And, you know, I, I very much live like that now. I, I really focus on, on, on what I'm trying to birth, the people I care about, the people that I can help as well. Um, yeah. And it's, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, that doesn't mean my eye doesn't get drawn to other things and doesn't care for other things, but it, but it also means that I can really show up for the the change in the world that i want to i want to see and be yeah yeah Ah. and i think that's a really beautiful point to kind of wrap up on it's the point of um focus and attention and energy you know those those really important aspects of 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 leadership of our leading ourselves our self-leadership Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's leadership is a journey. Sovereignty is a journey. Stepping up and owning our our power is a journey. And in my opinion, we need help with that. We need mirrors. We need people, good people around us to challenge, to probe, to inquire, to support. Um, it cannot be done alone. Uh, the the lone wolf days, in my opinion, are over. Um, they're going to keep you incredibly stuck and if you're a man listening to this and you're thinking about taking that risk to like 
step into men's work, men's arena, you know, work with you or come to a retreat with us. It's like, take the risk. Yeah. Because what's at risk if you don't do that, you're going to end up with the same outcome. So, so maybe that, that's living life with anxiety and fear and, you know, that's already there. So if, if it, if I take the risk and I go, then that's going to bring up anxiety and fear, but, but actually there might be something on the other side of that. And that's, that's really magical. And, I hope that, you know, through this podcast, through other means that you and others and ourselves are doing incredible work that we can reach more men and support more men and change the world one man at a time through, through supporting, supporting him. Um, yeah. I've loved having a chat today. Thank you, David. No, thank you. It's been a, a real pleasure to talk about the many facets of, of of men's work and being a man, you know, what comes up around that, like it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel we've weaved in between all sorts of, I see definitely a few notes, weaved in between all sorts of different topics and facets. Um, so it's been fantastic. And I imagine the listeners are really excited to hear, you know, when they can, where they can find you, where they can get in contact with you about your retreats and, and, and the, the work you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Um, so yeah, you can find us at www.theunmaskedman.co.uk. And uh, we run level one, level two, and level three retreats. So level run, one retreats uh, run three or four times throughout the year. And then we run level two. Level one is boy to king. So it's moving from that boy psychology to sovereign psychology, yeah, man psychology, really initiation journey, putting a, 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 a man back on his throne. <clears throat> path of the king is our level two which is about maintaining kingship right i've got i've found my, my throne but how the hell do i stay here and then level three is about facing joy which can sometimes get lost on the self-development journey like oh i've done all this shadow work but i forgot to actually be happy how do i how do i access that yeah so that's that's a big part of it and then we run facilitator trainings to help men step up into this as well this work do this work teach this work it's really powerful uh, one-to-one coaching as well. And we've got um, in-person circles. We've got uh, one in London um, over in Shoreditch near Box Park. We've got one in Harrogate and we've got one in East Sussex. Um, and yeah, you can reach out to me on my Instagram, Alexander underscore Cottle, C-O-T-T-L-E, which I'm sure will be in the link below as well, uh, or the dot unmasked man. Um, you can find us there. Beautiful, beautiful. And thank you, yeah, man. If you're listening to this, definitely go and check out Alexandria's wonderful work. Um, because it it's the risk is worth taking. You know, mm. the risk is really worth taking. You know, fortune favors the brave. I look through my own life and go, I've taken many risks and lots of them have not really gone anywhere and paid off. But the ones that have and there's been many have paid off and they've paid off in huge dividends. And mm-hmm. we can only really know if we take the risk and take the, take, try it out like wholeheartedly and fully because, you know, just staying where you are doing what you're doing, making mm-hmm. the tiny, almost insignificant changes. I know a lot of men say they're doing doesn't create mm-hmm. big shifts in your life, you know, and you, mm-hmm. you've experienced this when you listen to this man. So t- making change, taking risk, like it's it's worth it. It's worth it. That conservatism is is not gonna get you to where you want to get to in your life and inspire the world with your with your magic, with your gifts, with your message. Hundred mm, percent. Don't be afraid of your greatness. Same input, same outcome. Take that leap of faith and and become the man you're always born to be. Awesome. Well, thank you, listeners. If you enjoyed the episode. Feel free to reach out. Let us know. It's always beautiful to hear from people who uh, enjoy the episodes. I, regularly, women re- reach out to me and really um, say how nourished they are by the conversations I have with men in particular because they're just yearning to hear that that mature man, that conscious man speak. So always, always a joy to hear from people. But until next week, I thank you, Alexander. And thank you for listening. I say ciao, ciao. I want to say a big thank you for listening you know it's people like yourself that really help get the podcast out into the world 
you know, especially if you're often sharing the episodes and the podcast with people that you, th- you feel just could do with listening, right? Can see a different way of being a man, maybe a different way of having dating lives and intimacy and relationships. So I want to say a big thank you. And if maybe after listening to this episode, you think, oh, there's someone actually who could really do with this, please share it with them, you know, share the love. I'm really, really grateful. And if, you know, you want to get in contact with me for any questions, or you want to talk about coaching or any working together, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at theauthenticman underscore, or you can email me hello at theauthenticman.net. Thank you very much.